Thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, yes, I'm Brendan Lake from NYU. It's true that computers can now recognize objects, they can drive cars, they can defeat Go champions, yet human intelligence is still by far the best example of intelligence that we have, and I want to understand why are people smarter than machines. In order to get at this question, my lab at NYU studies computational problems that are easier for people than they are for machines. There are many problems to choose from, including all those on this slide and many others, and they range from general characteristics of intelligence to specific tasks that people perform better. Here we're gonna focus on two problems in particular, concept learning and question asking, and how we use program induction in order to study them, with two closely related goals, to better understand how human, the human abilities and how people solve these problems, but also to take meaningful steps towards building more powerful and more human-like machine learning algorithms. As I mentioned, we're gonna talk about these two different case studies. In particular, program induction for concept learning with recursive visual concepts, and also uh, program induction for question asking. Before we get there, I want to briefly mention our work on Bayesian program learning and Omniglot. And many of you uh, may have seen or read about this work. Um, Josh Tenenbaum, one of the co-authors on this paper, uh, mentioned it uh, in, his, in his keynote a couple days ago. And it also it received a lot of attention when it came out um, in science in 2015. So I wanted to mention just a couple things about it as it sets the stage for the, the case studies that are coming next. The goal of this project was to study one-shot learning abilities for a wide class of concepts. And we have a program induction model that can infer probabilistic programs from a single example from raw data. So from an image of a character, infer a stochastic motor program in order to produce new images of that character. And we evaluated the model on various generative tasks in addition to discriminative and classification tasks, and this was one example, which was to generate a new example task, where nine different people were provided with an image of a new character and were asked to produce a new example of that character while the model was asked to do the same thing. And you can think of this as a visual Turing test for each of these uh, different characters, which grid was produced by people versus the machine. So I'll give you a second to, to see if you can uh, guess for, for these four, which is the machine? And then I'll show you the answer. All right. So highlighted in red here are the machine-produced examples, and can, it can be very hard to tell. We looked at many more tasks, including one-shot classification, generating new examples, but with the dynamics, so rather than just seeing the static images produced by human versus the machine, to see them actually drawn and, and, and uh, get that type of information as well. We also looked at generating new concepts tasks where you uh, come up with characters that look like they belong to a novel alphabet, and again, compared human versus machines, and also generating new concepts without constraints. And on all these different tasks, the algorithm either reached human level performance or was difficult to tell whether the behavior is produced by humans or the machines. So what is the power of thinking about concept learning as program induction? What uh, BPL demonstrated were that programs provide causal descriptions of how your data was generated. And so rather than just recognizing patterns and, and performing classification, uh, it provides an explanation of where the data come from and how it was produced. Programs also support flexible generalizations to new tasks, and that, that was key to, to that example, where once you have the program, you can apply it to all those different generative tasks rather than just a single task. And that's, that, I think, is one of the pow powers of generative programs. Programs support compositional learning, so you can compose new programs, new concepts out of the pieces of existing programs and concepts, and also probabilistic programs can handle noise and support more creative tasks, if, especially if you're using probabilistic programs. But the, the story is, is far from complete, and let's, let's think about this question seriously. Does the mind learn genuine programs to represent concepts? And there's many unresolved questions. In particular, with characters, they have some special properties in that the programs are unusually concrete and they're also embodied in that the program, it's actually in your own body and you can execute it and produce letters. And that's not the case for many of the, the concepts that we reason about every day. So what are the limits of this ability? How general is it? Um, do people require explicit in instruction or experience with the nature of the process? Or can they infer the process from its outputs? And finally, do mental concepts naturally include powerful computational techniques that are common in programs like recursion in particular? 
But let's jump into the first case study on learning recursive visual concepts. And where we, we I was motivated by all the questions I just mentioned, and this is joint work with Steve Piantadosi, um, who's now at Berkeley. I mentioned recursion, and it's not just an abstract programming concept. It occurs in the real world with many natural categories that, that arise through some form of recursive process, and I have some examples uh, there on the left side of the screen. And to give you another example uh, that's, that's more abstract, uh, L systems is a, is a recursive language that can be used to procedurally generate tree-like objects or, or um, naturalistic looking objects like the tree over here, and that's the, the simple recursive program that will produce that tree. So how do people learn concepts like this, and do they learn programs? To examine this question, we can't use trees. We, we have to, and, and we're going to run behavioral experiments here and, and try to get at it. We, we, we have to use novel concepts that people don't already know. But we can define the concepts in a similar language, so the one I showed you on the previous slide, or define them using these L systems and test the limits of the human ability to learn um, from a very small, small number of examples. So here's the setup that we used. We told participants that a surface was infected with a new type of alien crystal, and the crystal's been growing for some time. So that was the surface, and then now it's grown into that figure. And then we asked, what do you think the crystal is going to look like if you let it grow longer? So this is an audience participation moment. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand about which of those you think is what the crystal is going to grow into. So can you raise your hand if you think A is, is what it's going to grow into? What about B? OK, lots of computer scientists in the room. And here's another example, different crystal. It's infected the surface and grown, and uh, the, the right answer in this case is A. So the concepts are defined in a compositional language for expressing these causal processes. And I mentioned that they are L systems. And I'll say a few things about L systems if you're unfamiliar. It's a lot like a context-free grammar in that it's a series of rewrite, string rewrite rules. But rather than like a context-free grammar where you apply the rules one at a time, you apply the rules in parallel in all possible locations on the string. So in this case, the start symbol is an F. And there's a rewrite rule for F and G. And at the first iteration, we get that string on the, the right-hand side in the middle of the screen there, f minus i and g, and, and so on. And then at the next iteration, we get that more complicated string at the, the bottom right of the screen. Now, uh, L systems pair very nicely with turtle graphics from the, the logo programming language, where the, the idea here is turtle is, there's, there's a little turtle, and it runs across the canvas dragging ink. And the turtle's following the symbolic commands as a movements that turtle should make. So to decode this, the plus sign means a right turn, and the minus sign means a left turn for turtle. And also there's two different symbols for going straight, and you also sample the angle that turtle um, moves and, and also um, the, the rules for uh, generating the system. So what you can do here is take the symbolic form and render it into a visual interpretation. And that's what you get with, you can see the little movie of, of turtle producing the figure. And then you can see the visual interpretation of the more complicated symbolic form. So this is the concept. The concept is the program. And those are instances of the program. So every time you iterate, you get a new instance of the, the, the category. And we're going to see if you can do induction just from the image and infer the process that generated it. Here's the experiment that we ran. It was a classification experiment. We recruited participants on Mechanical Turk, showed them 24 different fractal concepts. They didn't get any feedback. Throughout the entire experiment, they just made a guess and moved on. And there were six choices for each, uh, each of the different concepts. It's a lot like the demo that we all did together a moment ago. And there's distractors generated by taking the base and swapping out the rule with an incorrect one and, and using that to produce distractors. There's two different conditions, a latent condition and a stepwise condition, where the, the latent condition, you just see the before and the after, and you have to predict how it's going to continue to grow, and the stepwise condition where you actually see the series of steps of the crystal growing, and then you have to predict what the next step is, and participants were in one condition or the other. Here's the full set of stimuli that we provided to participants. And here is what we found. The y-axis is the percent correct in the six-way judgment. And 
Both groups were well above chance, about 65% correct in their judgments, and there was no detectable difference between the groups, but we weren't necessarily looking for one. And we can define a Bayesian program learning, a program induction model for learning concepts in this space. And how this is done is we, we need a grammar now on top of the, the L system. So we have a probabilistic context-free grammar that samples L systems. And that provides a prior distribution over possible concepts. So these sample the rules for L systems. And then also, so you, you sample L. And then you have to sample the depth, too. How many steps do you want to unroll the, the program? And then with those two pieces, we can use Turtle and render it down into an image. So we have a full generative process that can produce a concept and then produce images from the concept. And we use Bayesian inference where we can uh, invert this and reason about what's the distribution on likely concepts given the data that we have. There's an important note here that we're, we're going to compare people to this algorithm. And the, the algorithm has exactly the right programming language. And people clearly don't. So if people can infer programs like these, it's because their general programming language, their language of thought, is sufficiently general that it can learn these types of programs and many other things. And that's, that's quite impressive. But the, certainly the model has a big advantage here. To compare with perceptual similarity, we took a pre-trained ComNet on, on AlexNet just to see if visual features with lots of real-world experience gives you the right metric for similarity for making these classification judgments. So on the top left is the anchor stimulus, and uh, those are the distractors, and, uh, uh, and they're ordered from the closest to the furthest away, so going left to right and then for the, the bottom row. And for ComNet and the classic distances used in computer vision, they prefer the distractor that has the smallest perturbations, and that the one to the right is the one that you get. And the right answer at the bottom middle is actually um, quite far apart in this raw visual feature space. So you, you, you need something else here. ComNets don't give this to you uh, immediately when trained on a large amount of visual experience. So here, the, the, with the, the, the models plotted, the com net is, is around the, the baseline. And the program induction model, if you run inference for long enough, gives you 100% correct. So it's, why, are, why is the model better than people? It's plausible that people, while sometimes successful at discovering the right program from the image, other times they fail to find the right answer. And if, if you uh, do enough of these intuitively, that, that, that feels like what's happening. Sometimes you get it, uh, how, how the crystal's actually growing, and other times you're, you're, you're quite uncertain. What we did is rather than doing unlimited MCMC inference, we restricted the amount of inference to fit the overall, overall level of accuracy of the participants by, by truncating it. And this is not an accomplishment in itself. Like we we uh, set the accuracy to be the same. But what's interesting is when you do that, it now gives you an, an ability to predict what concepts are easier or harder for people to learn. And we get a correlation of about 0.6 in terms of the same concepts being easier for the model as they were for people. One concern with this task is that there may be other heuristics that would allow you to do classification that isn't quite the same as learning a program, and one of which is a look for a smaller copy heuristic, where if you look for a smaller copy of iteration two and iteration three, sometimes you have to rotate it or warp it in some way, but it would allow you to do well on the classification tasks that, that I showed you previously. What we did in the second experiment was a generation test, much like with the handwritten characters where we had a bunch of different tasks, both discriminative and generative. Now we have a generative task where we actually ask people to create a new example from this underlying program. And this is an example if you're a participant in that stepwise condition where you see a series of steps of growth. And then you get this interface. And how the interface works is you move your mouse across it and you can highlight the different line segments. And if it's green, and you it, and you highlight it in a screen and you click on it, it sprouts a little growth. And if you highlight it and it's red, you can undo a growth. And there's, there's some convenience button so you can turn everything on and turn everything off. It allows you to create an example you think belongs from the same program or is the next step in the process. Again, we ran a very similar experiment. We could only use some of the concepts from the previous uh, experiment because otherwise the line segments get very, very small and you couldn't click them. So we used the ones with the bigger line segments. And there, again, there was no feedback and there was these two different conditions. This is what we found on the y-axis is the 
of performance again, and the first metric we looked at was the individual clicks. So for each click, for each growth, did, was the right judgment made uh, by the participants. In the stepwise group, the performance is around 90% correct and 70 for the latent group, and well above uh, various baselines. A, a stronger metric is did people produce exactly the right example? Is it a true example from the class? Did they make no mistakes whatsoever? And this, in some cases, involved 125 decisions that all had to perfectly align in order to produce the right example. In the stepwise group, 60% of the time, participants were able to produce the right example. In the latent group, it was about 25% of the time, and again, ab above most of the baselines uh, in, in the latent group. I'll show you just some individual trials. Here is an example of of this uh, concept, which is quite simple, it's a triangle stacking uh, concept, and it's the stepwise condition. The ground truth is shown at the bottom, bottom where you, you add an additional triangle on top, and 14 people, which is everyone in this condition, were able to produce the right instance here, were able to generate um, the, the right example. In the latent group, if you just see the before and the after, the, the growth, and then ask to make a completion or generate a new example, six people out of uh, 12 in this case actually still got it right, which is, is pretty good. As you can see, there's a lot of other interesting uh, uh, creations by uh, the other participants. Here's a more complicated uh, crystal uh, or program, and this one involved uh, over 100 decisions. And in the stepwise condition, six participants made all those decisions correct and produced exactly the right crystal. And in the latent condition, about three of the participants did. So here are some interim conclusions for this case study. We explored a very difficult concept learning task for people, and although people were variable, they generalized in ways that were consistent with learning a recursive program, although there's still more to understand, uh, especially in the cases where uh, the judgments went wrong and people produced alternatives. And although in machine learning, uh, People often talk about object rec recognition as though it's solved. Machines need to represent causal processes, maybe even programs, to learn concepts and perceive scenes like people do. And this is true for the stimuli and the experiment, but also the, the motivating concepts of, in, in real images that I, I showed at the beginning. Not just for recognizing them, but to be able to do all the judgments and reasoning that you can do with any of these uh, Stimuli, like is it dangerous to enter the cave or how that tree is going to grow if you clip it or if it's too close to your house. For all those types of reasoning, we really do understand something about the program that produces the data. And to reason like a person does and learn like a person does, we're going to have to be able to infer uh, those programs as well in our learning algorithms. The second case study that I want to talk about is about question asking. And this was a NIPS paper last year. Uh, th this is the work of Anselm Rota, who is a graduate student at NYU, and also my colleague Todd Gorekas. And again, it's motivated by human ability that eludes the best algorithms. And we wanted to compare active learning for people and machines. Say a, a child is visiting the zoo and they're learning about animals. And uh, the boy sees this bee. So these are the real types of questions that children ask in, in scenarios like this. Like, how do they grow their babies? Or to the koala, why is he up in a tree? Or what's the difference between a shark and a fish? Interesting, rich, creative questions that tap into the causal structure of how things work in the world. But if you ask an active learning algorithm to, that's trying to learn about animals and classify images to ask questions, really the only question it ever asks is, what is the category label of this object? What is the category label of this object? What is the category label of this object? And I'm simplifying a little bit. Of course, there's chatbots and dialogue systems that could ask more interesting questions than this, although often they're pre-programmed. But it's fair to say that there's no algorithm that comes anywhere close to the richness and the complexity of the human ability to ask questions while learning. We wanted to study question asking in, in a domain that allowed free form question asking, really allowed people to ask anything they wanted, but we wanted the test to be simple enough that we could write down a Bayesian ideal learner so we could quantify exactly how good the questions are that people are asking. And this led us to the battleship task, and it's a lot like the kids game battleship, if you're familiar, if you played before. 
there's these ships that are hidden in a grid. It, our variant's a little bit different. There's always three ships, a blue, purple, and a red one. And they have a size, but it's an unknown size. So there's an unknown size, an unknown location, and an unknown orientation for each of the ships. And the goal is to try to figure out where the ships are when you're playing the game. So like a normal battleship, the grid is covered up, and you can click the tiles to try to reveal where the ships are, or you possibly could hit water tiles, and you, you try to do this as efficiently as possible. So in our version, you play Battleship for a little bit, and then the game pauses, and you have a special opportunity not just to click a tile, but to ask any question you want about where the ships are. So really a, a free-form question-asking opportunity. You can type it into the text box on Mechanical Turk, and there were very few constraints, one of which was the, the question had to be answerable with a single word or number. You couldn't ask, tell me where all the ships are, right? That, otherwise, uh, that, that would be a valid question. So it has to be a question that you can answer with a single uh, piece of information and, and try not to stack multiple questions together were the only constraints. We collected this corpus of uh, over 600 questions that participants asked and, and cataloged them all. So I'll tell you about just a few of the different types. There were location questions. These are participants that asked about like what color is at a particular row and column in the grid. So these are participants that although they could ask about anything they wanted, they tended to just play normal battleship anyway, but by typing it in the text box. So not hugely creative. But other participants uh, asked about the different regions of the board, rows, columns, quadrants. Participants commonly asked about the size of the ship. The most common question is, what is the size of the red ship, or is the thread red ship three tiles long? Questions like that. The numbers here are how many times it occurred in the corpus. There's questions about orientation and whether ships touch that people came up with, and also demonstration questions, which are especially powerful. And here's a really good question that su surprised us as the experimenters. We didn't think of it before we ran this experiment. What at what location is the top left part of the purple ship, for instance? It's a great question. It gives you a tile because the answer is a particular tile that is going to be purple. And it gives you some geometry about where the rest of the ship is. And it tells you immediately where to start clicking afterwards. So it's a great question. And some participants were smart or, or clever enough to, to come up with this. An especially fascinating challenge, and the one we wanted to tackle, in addition to doing a lot of other things with this data set, is to try to understand how do people think of the question to ask? And can we develop algorithms that ask human-like questions? So here, a powerful idea is to think about question asking, or questions as programs, or question asking as a type of program synthesis, where the programs are no longer used to represent concepts or generate uh, the raw images that are examples of a concept, but here the programs are questions such that if you were an oracle and knew the true state of the, state of the world and you ran the program, it would be able to return the answer to your question. And it's not program synthesis in the classic sense where you have input-output pairs and you try to synthesize the program to produce it, um, but it's literally a generative model of programs where you can apply it to the scenario and synthesize a set of programs that hopefully match the distribution of questions that people ask. So that's our goal here. And I'll tell you about uh, the progress that we've made. Um, the, we start with some primitive programs, which in this case, they're, they're written in Lisp notation. So if you're unfamiliar, the, everything's in brackets, and the first uh, token is the name of the function, and then the additional tokens are the arguments of that function. And these primitives come basically straight from the rules of the game as we describe it to participants. Every ship has a size, and every ship has an orientation. So you have a simple program that returns the size and the orientation of a particular ship, or the color at a particular tile. So with these base programs, these are very simple questions, if you think about it. And if you give some simple comp compositional operators, even just addition and equality and some other simple list primitives, you, just from a few basic combinations, you start to see some of the creative uh, uh, accomplishments that people came, came up with in our data set of, of question asking. To give you a few examples, some participants thought to ask, what is the total size of all the ships? in the board. So sum all the sizes together. And of course, this is a program that takes all those base programs and then sums up their outputs. Or a clever question, are the blue and the red ship parallel to one another, is another question participants came up with. And here, if you want to represent just, again, the semantics of, of that question, it's just two orientation programs where you check whether their outputs are equal or not. And if you look at this data set carefully, you see this um, 
this type of compositionality all over the place, where the, the interesting creative questions are often simple compositions of more basic ones. So the next step is Anselm uh, wrote a list program for every single question in that data set, and then constructed a dom domain-specific language such that all those questions were grammatical. And of course, now an infinite set of other questions are also possible, right? So we have this language that contains all those questions and also an infinite number of other ones. And now we wanted to see if we could do question asking as a type of program generation. The first thing we wanted to do was, of course, find the optimal question in Battleship, right? What's the best question you can ask? And what we did here is we searched the, the language um, by maximizing expected information gain. Expected information gain is roughly if you're a Bayesian learner and you're keeping track of all the possible hypotheses of where the ships are, and your question helps you rule out hypotheses, what is the question that in probability will, in expectation, will um, most likely rule out the most hypotheses. And uh, what we find is that for people, they're relatively, conf very, relatively happy with asking a simple question like, what is the size of the red chip? But for uh, the algorithm, it's greedy. It wants to know the size of all of the ships. So what it does, it asks for the size of the red ship and then says, can you add that to 10 times the size of the blue ship and then 100 times the size of the purple ship? So it constructs these polynomials such that you get a three-digit number or that gives you all the sizes, right? And it doesn't stop there. It constructs these crazy polynomials that it can backtrace the entire state of the game from an a arbitrary number. So that's not human-like question asking. You would not want to have a conversation with somebody that asks questions like that. And what we wanted to do is to see if we could learn a probabilistic generative model of questions that will ask more human-like questions. So the notation here at x is the question. We have a feature function. We, we uh, evaluated all these features with uh, you know, held out log likelihood to see what the, the most important features are. And we got expected information gain, uh, length, the, ans the length of the program, the type of the answer, and so on. And we fit these log linear models where the, the energy of a question is just a simple linear combination of the features. And uh, then that provides the probability of the question in a context-sensitive way because the features depend on the current context of the world. So we fit this with uh, maximum likelihood. And uh, again, uh, we, we find that all these features are, are essential. Another uh, finding is that compositionality is absolutely key. Yeah, uh, uh, oh, just a couple more slides. So uh, compositionality is absolutely key. There's 18 of these different scenarios. And if you hold out one and try to predict its questions just by reusing the questions people ask for the other scenarios, then you'll never succeed because 15% of the time people ask a genuinely new question. So there's no way you can perform this task without a notion of compositionality. So I'll tell you about one, one evaluation we did where we asked the algorithm to generate new questions that were unique, that nobody, uh, it, nobody saw or nobody actually produced in the data set. So in this context, seven here, the two best human questions in ter terms of VID were how many tiles are occupied by ships or how many ships are four tiles long. And in terms of the, this, these are five samples from the algorithm, but we constrain them to be unique so that the, the algorithm is really coming up with these questions. And I'm just going to highlight a few that I thought were the most interesting. Here's one that asked, are all the ships horizontal? Of course, we translated the lisp into natural language here. But it's an interesting question that's quite natural and human-like. Are all the ships horizontal? In this other context, we got questions like, what is the top left of all the ship tiles? Which this question blew my mind a little bit because it's, it's even better than the other top left question because you, you take all the top left locations for all the different ships and then take the top left location of those and you get a tile and gives you global geometry about the board and this again was uh, sampled from the algorithm. Also, there, it also samples some less intuitive things like are the blue and the purple ship touching and the red and purple ship not touching or vice versa that, that a person wouldn't ask, but here the energy was quite a bit um, higher. So just uh, two, two slides to wrap up. A few words about future directions. In my lab, we're thinking about ways of combining the strength of Bayesian program learning and programs with deep learning, and we've seen this theme in the talks so far today and I, I think also in, in the talks to come. 
And uh, the, the motivation here being that for program induction and probabilistic programming, we get strong causal compositional learning, and you've seen that in the, the examples that I talked about. But also often re requires a relatively complete scheme of how your data is generated for the characters or the fractals or even for the questions. You have to know most of the pieces of how to sample your data all the way from the top all the way front to the bottom. And in deep learning, it, the algorithms are very general. Neural networks can capture richer dependencies in that you can make your network bigger if your data set's bigger and capture more complicated types of correlations. And that's something that I don't think we've captured in, in program t uh, induction techniques, but is an incre incredibly powerful aspect of deep learning. But it's difficult to incorporate prior knowledge, causal knowledge, if you have it, or if you know that the mind uses it. And it's hard to perform crisp compositional learning in the same way you can with program induction. So I think there's a sweet spot for even more powerful human-like learning that hopefully combines the best of both where you can get strong, genuine, compositional and symbolic learning, but maintains uh, the generality and also the power of deep learning uh, to uh, learn about distributions that have extremely complicated dependencies. To conclude, we can understand a few aspects of distinctively human abilities through program induction. I talked about the two case studies in concept learning and question asking. And I think this is an important direction for building more human-like algorithms through program induction, where learning causal models of the data rather than just recognizing patterns, getting flexible generalization to new tasks that it wasn't trained on, crisp, rapid compositional learning, and also powerful active learning through question asking. Thank you very much.